5.15 exactly. <laughs> well, good evening and welcome to the first uh, in our 2018 Draper After Dark series um, presented by the Draper Natural History Museum here at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. And we're thrilled to have you here. I think uh, almost everybody knows me, but I'm Chuck Preston. I'm the senior curator here at the Draper Museum, and, and it's good to see many of you transfer from our lunchtime lecture series to our evening series. And it's tough on a Friday night. We usually try to avoid Friday nights um, because people are usually going here and there and heading out for the weekend. Uh, but so glad to have a, such a good crowd for you tonight. And you won't be disappointed. I think you're in for a real treat this evening. Uh, let me uh, let me introduce, I think, again, someone else, although she just walked out to get something to eat, I think, back there. But uh, um, let me uh, introduce to you Bonnie Smith, of course, who is our program coordinator for both the Draper After Dark and Lunchtime Expedition Series. And she's the one that got Dave here on time and in place and got everything all um, taken care of with the uh, the slides and, and such. So pleased with that. Oh, and one announcement I'll have this evening, and it's the only announcement I plan anyway, and that, of course, is to, if you have your little digital devices, if you'll turn those off or to mute uh, now. You know, we have two problems sometimes with that. Obviously, ringing in the middle of a program is not a good thing, but the other thing, occasionally it'll interfere with our Wi-Fi, depending on, on what's going on with that. So. Thank you for that. And again, thanks so much for coming out this evening. Um, this is a special treat uh, for me uh, to be able to bring our speaker in tonight uh, and tie in with the theme of the summer for us, which is the Monarch of the Skies. Uh, the exhibition we have, I hope you have a chance, to, if you haven't seen it, you have a chance to uh, see that. And while you're at it, you should see the Bierstadt exhibition as well. Wonderful sort of uh, conjoined themes in some way, both about um, witnessing potentially a vanishing part of the West. We are hoping, of course, that the Sagebrush Steppe ecosystem does not vanish, but we know that it has been in peril or imperiled for some time and has, has been drastically um, affected and fragmented, and we'll hear more about that today. And the take-home message, though, is not what's happening to it, although that's important. The take-home message, really, uh, is how incredibly rich and surprisingly so in many cases, um, that this environment we have that we take so much for granted and undervalue, I think, uh, is. And what better way to, to demonstrate that than through exceptional, really stunning visuals, the photography of our speaker here. So without further ado, let me introduce him to you. Uh, he's based in Colorado. He focuses his work on the American West. He's a senior fellow photographer in the International League of Conservation Photographers and works in partnership with numerous conservation groups, including, among others, the Audubon Rockies and the Wilderness Society. In 2017, he joined the faculty of the Summit Series of Photo Workshops. In addition to the book that he will be signing later this evening, and Bonnie will tell you a little bit more about that later, uh, in addition to Sage Spirit, published by Braided River, he also wrote the award-winning book, Prairie Thunder, published by Skyline Press in 2007. In fact, I think that was about the last time, Dave, that you were up here, at least you and I were together uh, up here out in the sagebrush. His photographs and articles have appeared in numerous publications, including Audubon, Conservation Biology, Outside, Outdoor Photographer, National Parks Magazine, High Country News, Wilderness, and elsewhere. Please give a warm welcome this evening to Dave Showalter. Howdy. That's Wyoming for hello. All right. Well, welcome. Thanks for being here. And it's great to be back in Cody. Can everybody hear me OK? Am I too loud? Is this good? On the Absorca Bay, Beartooth Front, and where we're taking in a view of the McCullough Peaks, where I was out this morning with Dave Burks. But Dave Burke, such a spectacular place in the sagebrush ecosystem. And by back in Cody, uh, in 2011, I was hired by the Greater Yellowstone Coalition to photograph an assignment for the intention of protecting the Absorca Beartooth Front and, and to be a part of their great conservation campaign. 
So I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along. Thank you, Chuck, for the kind introduction. I did meet Chuck while I was working in Cody a few years back, and uh, he kindly took me out to show me some of his field work. So we went out in the Oregon Basin, and we set an eagle trap. I say we generously. Chuck and Philip were doing all the work. but So here we have a, an eagle trap with um, a bunny in it, if I can uh, get my clicker to turn on. A bunny in it and a spring-loaded trap and a remote control to, to catch the eagle and, and to, to do research on, on the, the, the animal and then let it go unharmed. So it was really cool to, to be a part of that. And yeah, so I'm here also with my wife Marla, so it's great to have her here, the love of my life. She's back there, she can't hide, so please say hi to all the nice Wyoming people, honey. And uh, we've been enjoying the area very much. The other day we were up at uh, Misty Moon Lake in the Bighorns, and a couple nights later we were in up the Elk Fork, camped up there, and seeing the sights and just taking in this incredible place, this greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And so we're in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and also the Bighorn Basin, two places that are just rare in the world. So wonderful to be here. So just to get started, to witness wild bison, our national mammal, roaming freely across a big landscape beneath the Teton Range, it's, it, it's just remarkable. And folks from all over the world are inspired by our Western wildlife and our open spaces, our protected public lands. These are public lands that belong to each one of us if we're an American citizen. And my vantage point here is in the sage, feet firmly planted in the sage of Antelope Flats. And if people don't think they know the sagebrush ecosystem, maybe they've been to Teton National Park. And if you know Teton National Park and if you've been in Antelope Flats, you know a little bit about the sagebrush ecosystem. There's another side to the New West, and this is another view of the sagebrush, just about 80 miles south on the Pinedale Anticline, south of Grand Teton National Park. And this was developed just a little over 20 years ago, so not very long, when the new fracking technology came about. It's had a, a huge effect on, on wildlife. So these industrial gas fields, and there's seven or so major industrial energy fields in the West. They lead to habitat loss, as, as Chuck mentioned a mom, moment ago, and habitat fragmentation, big issues in the West. Wildlife declines, and, and they threaten our Western way of life. Not saying energy is bad, but we have to be really careful about where we put things, because we don't have that much space left in the West. So with my time here tonight, these next 40 minutes or so, or so I'm going to show images of the sagebrush ecosystem this remarkable ecosystem and what's at stake. A little bit of background. Chuck mentioned my book, Prairie Thunder. That started at a refuge just outside of Denver, Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge. And so here, we, bison were reintroduced in 2007. There had been no wild bison on the Colorado prairie for 125 years. It was a huge moment. And now you can see bison roaming with a backdrop of, of Denver and of the Colorado Front Range. And the bison are doing great. Their, their habitat has been expanded. And the herd has gone, grown from something like 16 animals to, to well over 100. And they're a keystone species. And then there's another keystone species out there, the black-tailed prairie dog, that 160 animals depend on for food or shelter. And the burrowing owl that uses abandoned prairie dog burrows for shelter and to, to, um, to breed and to raise their young. So that's pretty neat. And black-footed ferrets were just reintroduced three years ago, and there's been a couple of releases. And they're doing great, and they're having kits. And these guys are all descendants of the Matitsi ferrets that were discovered in 1979 because we thought this species was extinct in 1979, that recently. And 18 animals were pulled out of the Pitchfork Ranch and, and went into breeding populations. And all of the ferrets that we have in the world, our most endangered mammal, came from this little pocket on a ranch just south of here. Think about that for a minute. Great stuff. 
huge mule deer at the arsenal. So I'm, I'm starting to understand the web of life that, that, that makes up this short grass prairie ecosystem. And also photographing habitat treatments because we have to burn to discourage invasive species and encourage native grasses so these animals can thrive. And then I've ventured out on the eastern plains and my first experience with lecking birds. A lek is a mating ground that grouse return to every year, year after year, for thousands of years sometimes. And so I, my first experience was in Yuma County in northeast Colorado, sitting in a little portable blind in the dark, and then all of a sudden you hear the, the, the blowing over a top pop bottle sound of, of the booming of, of greater prairie chickens. And then along comes a coyote, and it's a wily e. coyote moment, and I think my whole, my whole shoot is ruined, but he finally gave up and the birds came back, and, um, and I was able to make those images. And I was that day super hooked on lecking birds, and have been ever since. It's just a part of my DNA now. So it wasn't a big jump to go from the prairie to the sage, because there was a lot of the same critters and a lot of the same issues. And I think more importantly, they're both looked at as drive-through country, as just what's out there. There's nothing out there. Dave Burke and I were talking about that this morning. The people whiz by on the highway and they look at McCullough Peaks and say there's nothing out there. And in my mind, that's the center of the universe. Everything's out there. So I published this book with Braided River. And what Braided River does is they do conservation photography books. That's all they do. And they work with with conservation partners. My partners on this book are Audubon Rockies, the Wilderness Society, and Sierra Club, Wyoming chapter. Some of you may know Connie Wilbert, who's the person that I worked closely with there, and also Bruce Hamilton at Sierra Club. And so then we can amplify our voices, right? We can become a foundation of campaigns, and we can, we can reach a lot more folks that way. So that's what Braided River does. I didn't start out to do a grouse book, and it's not a grouse book. But necessarily, sage grouse need to be the face because you, you need a charismatic character, right, to tell a story. What really concerned me was just habitat loss, that in our backyard, we were losing just enormous swaths of land to an energy boom that happened when the new frac fracking technology came on board. So that's, that's why I started. My path led me a lot to Wyoming. And uh, this is a pretty Wyoming-centric uh, uh, talk tonight, but um, my favorite place out of all, people ask me, what's your favorite place? And without hesitation, I will tell you, it's the Red Desert. And oftentimes I would find myself working in the gas fields around Pinedale. I'd sleep in these gas fields to know what the experience was like. And when I was done with that part of, uh, of an expedition, where would I go? I would go to the Oregon Buttes near Farson. And, and just exhale and, and feel like I'm home. And it's just such an incredible moving thing to be there. Warren Murphy's here tonight, and, I, and, and Warren calls it a sacred place, and I, I respect that view a lot because I feel the exact same way. And a lot of folks before us, long before us, felt that way as well. It's not, it's not undeveloped. People have been there for a long time, but it's, it's pretty, pretty darn good as sage goes, and it's a, a biodiverse, the whole web of life almost is represented there. And if you go up on top of those buttes and you look across the largest unfenced area in the lower 48, you say, my God, what is wilderness if not this place? Spent a lot of time in Grand Teton National Park, and I still do. But Antelope Flats has everything from you know, the smallest sagebrush songbirds to, to grizzly bears and wolves roaming through. So I, I think it's probably the most intact piece of, of sage out there, and, and, it, and it's not that big, but Antelope Flats is just incredible. And boy, oh boy, you learn that this ecosystem is harsh sometimes. You know, right now it's pretty, pretty sweet. Temperatures are just right, but it can be super hot and super cold. And when I made this image in Lamar Valley in Yellowstone National Park, it was 54 below zero. My car, car battery froze solid that day. I couldn't turn my car off. I had to drive all the way to Livingston to get a new battery, and I was back in the park by that night, but it was damn cold. So sage grouse, greater sage grouse. What's the big deal about sage grouse? They're in the news an awful lot. 
And right now, we're, we're having political battles about what to do with sage grouse. Sage grouse have been here for 25 million years. They show up on the same lek every year, as I mentioned a moment ago, for eons. And they perform this elaborate courtship display. It bugs me to no end to read that they are a chicken-like bird that lives in sage, or that they're a chicken-sized bird that lives in sage, because I know this bird a little bit. And I'd, one thing I'd like to ask of you is to help change that discourse, that part of the conversation about these creatures, no matter what creature it is, because we have this thing that I call wildlife elitism, where we, we think, you know, an elk is better than a wolf or, or something else is better than a prairie dog. I like to just call sage grouse our noble, iconic western bird with an elaborate courtship display. And I, and I think that words matter. I think words matter a lot. And um, it gives them stature. And another thing about these guys is they are an umbrella species. So if you protect habitat for sage grouse and they need large, unbroken expanses of sage, that's about all they need. They don't need any help from us. But if we protect that habitat, we go a long ways towards protecting habitat for everything else. It's not a perfect equation or anything like that. But that umbrella status protects 350 other species, nearly every living thing in the West. So what about that elaborate courtship display? The female here, so what, what she'll do is, she, you know, the males are displaying all over the lek. Imagine a place that's maybe twice the size of this room with not much sage in it, kind of kind of just grassy and, and open, and, and so the birds can see out and see if a golden eagle is, attack, is attacking or approaching. Um, and so there's birds all over it, and then the female will just raise her wings like this and the male will, that, that signals her readiness to mate and the male will hop on her back and the whole thing lasts about two seconds and you can see in this scene there's another female waiting for her turn. And that's because every female on that lek will mate with the same male. Now there, some biologist friends tell me there might be some hanky-panky in the sage with other males, but all of those males are displaying for their chance and for their turn. And they're, also, and they're also fighting for the right to mate. And quite literally with this species, they're fighting for survival because they're very imperiled. There's about 250,000 to 500,000 birds total in all of the West, 11 states, 176,000 square miles. We'll, we'll talk about that, that range in a little bit. Very imperiled bird totally dependent on sage, completely hardwired to sagebrush. So I'd like you to join me on a lek, if you would, please. Imagine, if you would, it's 18 degrees out. You've been sitting in a blind in the dark, little portable blind from Cabela's with thin nylon walls. It's not too windy, so it's pretty nice out. The smell of sage is just faintly on the air because it's not like sage after a rain, but you get that evocative smell. And you're just waiting as a photographer for something to happen. And then the birds come. And all those thoughts of coffee and being cold, all that stuff drifts away. So uh, I'm going to attempt to use this mic and play this movie. And what we're going to do is we're going to spend about eight hours on a lek but it's going to be in a little over a minute. So here goes.
and then they leave. And they go back in the sage and spend the day there and they come back the next morning and the next morning after that from roughly, they, they start showing up on Lex in early March and they go until mid-May sometimes. By the end, all of the females have made it and so you just have a bunch of knucklehead males that are displaying for each other and for the sage. Uh, the gentleman on the right is Dr. Matt Holleran. Matt uh, is a sage grouse researcher renowned for his PhD work that told us how much room sage grouse need and they need about four miles around each lek to, ha to capture most of their mating and, and breeding range. And we're not giving them that much room and so Matt is for, for decades now has been studying impacts of oil and gas on sage grouse. This is on the Pine Dale anticline and what you do is you go out in the middle of the night and there's a number of different ways to catch sage grouse. It involves ATVs and big nets and lights and um, and uh, so you catch the bird and, and do measurements and, 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 and record a lot of data about that, that individual and then you put a collar on them and you follow that bird through their life cycle. And that's, uh, that's how we've learned a lot about sage grouse. And this is what it looks like in the daytime at that spot. Now imagine behind me, this is a photographer's trick because behind me are a bunch of gas rigs drilling away but I'm looking out towards the Wind River Range because uh, it's just so incredible up on the Mesa near Pinedale. But um, this is the sagebrush ecosystem and the sage covers the valleys and basins of the west and it's the dominant plant and if you could think of it like a forest and like a carbon sink and start to you know maybe th think of it a little bit differently than just drive through country it can change your whole view shed. Monarch of the skies, right? Uh, just outside of Matisse, I photographed this magnificent bird uh, and I just was there for quite a while watching him do nothing and then one moment he just lifted off and I saw that magnificent wingspan and the talons and, and uh, unfortunately we're in this society we're always looking for a villain when, when, when sage grouse numbers decline we're saying, well, whose fault is it? It's everybody. It's somebody else's fault than ours, right? Um, and so we blame golden eagles. We say, gosh, you know, they're the major predator of sage grouse. But you know, if you're a golden eagle, you're just opportunistic. And if you see a piece of meat sitting out there on a lek, you're going to take it. So I, I think we ought to cut them some slack because they've evolved together over those eons with sage grouse. And and yes, they are a predator, but they'd much rather take a rabbit. <clears throat> Bighorn Basin has very high golden eagle density and the golden eagle is on Audubon's list of 306, 300 birds that are most threatened by climate change. We could blame ravens and some folks do and there are predator control pr programs going on right now where ravens are being shot in sage grouse territory but why do we have so many ravens? Let's be honest. We give them perches, we give them open dumps, we give them everything they need and they proliferate in numbers and the raven numbers are huge in the west so they do steal some sage grouse eggs the funny thing is they're so darn smart we can't really fully study what that mortality picture looks like so let's not blame ravens and golden eagles i will tell you this the last thing you want to see if you're a sage grouse is is this <laughs> it's game over. Um, so they're our top predator and they're opportunistic and let's not give them any more human perches than we have out there. Sage grouse gets a bad rap. Sage, grouse, sage brush is a very fair fuel but as a vegetable is a distinguished failure. Nothing can abide the taste of it but the jackass and his illegitimate child the mule. Thank you, Mark Twain. You're wrong because sage grouse and pronghorn and a few other species do eat sagebrush, but it gets a bad rap. And we've been treating sagebrush unkindly for a very long time, starting with the, the grazing free-for-all of the late 1800s when we had millions of sheep and cattle out on open range grazing grasses and forbs down to dust and to the point where we don't even know today what 
is called the herbaceous understory in the sage, what it looked like back then. And we're trying to, you know, recreate what we think it looked like. So there was a lot of grazing out there. And in 1916, the New York zoologist and conservationist William Hornaday wrote a paper called Save the Sage Grouse from Extinction. 1916. So for 102 years, we've known that we were wrongheaded with sage grouse. And sage grouse have fed, you know, mining crews and, and railroad crews you know, for, for a long time um, in the development of the West. Here, this is by Green River. I got this image from, it was donated by the Green River Museum there, which is a, is a great museum. And, uh, and these guys have sage grouse all over the hood and the running boards of, of their Model T. So hunting was an issue uh, for a long period in the early part of the last century. And there was agricultural conversion and, and dam building and all the stuff we do to transform the landscape, right? But what really has been a game changer has been this energy coming along uh, in the late 90s. So here we see a, a lone sage grouse on the Pinedale Anticline. And we see these transformed landscapes, these mega fields. These are our public lands. Just, I, I can't say this enough. If you go to a national park, a, a national forest, you're on Bureau of Land Management land, these are lands that belong to you. They belong to all of us. So we have a voice in how these lands are used. Yeah, we can drill for energy, we can do that stuff. But let's, let's do it sensibly. And let's look at the whole business on a landscape scale, not as little boxes on a map, and compartmentalize the whole West and chop it up. We can't have any more of these mega fields in the West. And I'm not just picking on oil and gas, because we have to be careful how we cite everything today. They're just, we're running out of sage in plain sight. So I flew over with Lighthawk, who's a partner, great partner. They flew all my aerial missions for me. And I, I wanted to fly over this Foot Creek wind farm west of Laramie, in between Laramie and Rollins, just to see what the footprint looked like. And man, it's enormous when you consider that these turbines are all the size of, of redwoods. And there's problems there, because sighting is everything. And there's golden eagle mortalities, and red-tailed hawk mor mortalities, and bat mortalities. And they send one guy out for one day a week to pick up dead birds, and, and that's how, how we determine the numbers of, of, of wildlife that we're losing. And it's just not good enough. We're better than that. So sighting is everything. We need to be, you know, we can't be putting residential developments in the path of the pronghorn, as we did near, near Pinedale. And this is Gunnison sage grouse habitat um, in Norwood, near Norwood, Colorado. Gunnison sage grouse are far more endangered than graders, and, and this will become ranchettes. And up until 2001, all sage grouse were just called sage grouse because we didn't know there were two species. And, uh, but in Gunnison, there was a couple of biologists that, that for certain knew that the vocalizations were different and that there are these, these broad white bands on their tail feathers, and these birds are about two-thirds the size of a greater sage grouse, and they just lek differently. They just, their behavior is, is different. So they were determined to be a distinct and separate species in 2001. Most of the birds reside in the Gunnison Basin of uh, West Central Colorado, and so they were named uh, the Gunnison sage grouse. And the cool thing is, there's only about four to 5,000 of them total, but the population is kind of stabilized um, in the Gunnison Basin. But the community has really gotten behind their namesake bird. And they're, you know, we've got folks pulling together from all walks of life, ranchers working alongside conservationists, and, and, and school kids are, are engaged. And, and so that's, that's where it's at in conservation, is this conservation and community. And it's, it's fantastic, and it's inspiring in Gunnison. In 2014, I got a call from Dr. Pat McGee at Western State College, and, and he's a biologist that I've worked with a good bit. And uh, Pat said, you'd never guess who was in my truck today. 
and, and, and he said, David Allen Sibley, the David Allen Sibley, whose guidebook rides shotgun with me everywhere I go. And uh, David Allen Sibley, until that day, the reason he was in Gunnison because, is because until that day, he had seen every bird in North America except for the Gunnison sage grouse. It was the last bird on his life list. And so he was on this same lek that I've photographed a number of times, and, and Pat's telling me this story. And <clears throat> So he sits there shivering in the dark, and he's all excited. He's going to see his last bird, and you can hear the birds. And, and then you can start to see the birds, and he's sketching madly. And then a golden eagle comes and flushes all the birds, and he says, just like all the rest of us say, what the hell just happened? And the thing is with Gunnison sage grouse is they don't come back after they've been flushed. They, they, they go to the sage, and that's, that's it. Your day's over. But um, ultimately, we asked him to write our forward. And uh, he kindly contributed the sketch from that day. So that was pretty neat. While we're worrying about lecking birds, we should also be concerned about Colombian sharp-tailed grouse. When Lewis and Clark came here, they were the most abundant game bird in North America. And now they're on about 10% of their historic range with 10% of, um, of their historic population. I photographed this bird and the previous Gunnison sage grouse that I showed, both on private land. So I think it's important to note that these partnerships, these public land, private land partnerships are super important because animals don't know the boundaries that we humans create. They only know habitat. And, and these birds come, again, they come back to the same place year after year. So it's great to have private land partnerships. And this rancher was very kind to let me uh, photograph on his ranch. This is the only map I'm going to show, and I'll spend just a few moments on it. But um, the, the primary thing we want to talk about here is the historic and current range of, of sage grouse. But um, first, if you just look at this whole business here, this is roughly the outline of the sagebrush sea. So this is, this is uh, the whole imperiled sagebrush sea. And then this purple part is the current range of greater sage grouse. Um, and the, the outside is, is the historic range. So they occupy 56% of their historic range. The yellow is the historic range of Gunnison sage grouse, and they've got the, most of the birds, 85% of the birds are right here, and then there are these satellite leks. Um, Gunnison sage grouse are listed as threatened with protection under the Endangered Species Act. The reason for that is that the satellite leks outside of the Gunnison Basin are not doing well. And so you're on some of these leks watching the birds, and there's maybe 12 birds. And, and then the next year, there's eight birds. And, and then you have to seed those populations. You have to trap birds and move them around to try to keep those outside populations viable. So all our eggs are literally in, in one basket. Um, yeah, so that's our, our geography. Now, the purple part, I'll say this. These are priority areas for conservation as well. and so. That was determined in the new sage grouse plan, and that's, those are the areas we have to get our arms around and protect. And we have to protect that, those areas fiercely. That's, that's where the highest density of sage grouse are. Why does it matter so much? Why are we focusing so much on this one species? Well, because it, it matters for everything else, too. We have three sagebrush obligate songbirds who the word obligate means they are obligated to breeze breed and raise their young in sage. They have nowhere else to go. And so here we have the sagebrush sparrow. She is brooding, so she's, she's rocking back and forth on her chicks. And then these are, are her chicks. And she occupies, again, if you think of the sage as, as a forest in miniature, she occupies the forest floor right up against the sagebrush stalk. And then here's a sage thrasher. These guys are just a little bit smaller than a robin. And they put their nests near the top of the sagebrush plant. And then the brewer's sparrow, little tiny guys, our smallest sparrow with the most beautiful, incredible, long song, have these little nests that are just like if you cupped your hand and, and uh, little tiny eggs. And they occupy kind of that mid-layer. So not only do they need sage, unbroken expanses of sage, they have site specificity, specificity within the sage. Easy for me to say. So, and, and we could throw pygmy rabbits in there too, but I haven't photographed them yet, but they're another sagebrush 
I'll look at species. Um, I'll, I'll get to those pygmy rabbits. And then mule deer share the same winter range as sage grouse. So we're seeing a mule deer collapse in the west. On the Pinedale anticline, since drilling began on their critical winter range, we've lost 60% of the Pinedale mule deer herd. Any hunters here? Anybody concerned about what's happening with mule deer? Yeah, it's a darn big issue, isn't it? And so we got to figure that out. And, and a lot of figuring it out has to do with protecting that core sagebrush habitat. In Colorado, we're seeing similar losses in northwest Colorado in an area that used to be called the mule deer factory. So we can't be developing these critical habitats. Everything else, everything else depends on sage. 350 species from the famous Bear 399 in Grand Teton National Park. I'll tell you a side story. There was just a sale of, of permits to shoot, to hunt grizzly bears since they got delisted. And a friend to many of us, Tom Mangelson, the, the, the famous photographer in, in Jackson, Tom put in for a permit. And I'll be darned if he didn't draw a permit. And he's gonna retire that thing. So um, I hope he gets a lot of publicity out of that. And I understand that his good buddy, Jane Goodall, also put in for ones. But, but grizzly bears use all of the habitats within this greater Yellowstone ecosystem. They use sage and riparian, and soon they'll be going up to alpine to, to eat army cutthroat, cutworm moths. And so they use all of it. And, uh, and a single Yellowstone grizzly needs about 400 square miles. These animals need room to roam. And all the way down to the little species, like the tiny bluebird in the Cottonwood Gallery Forest and the burrowing owl that again uses those abandoned prairie dog burrows at Kilprecker sand dunes right on the edges of the dunes. These are my tracks leading from the boar's tusk at Kilprecker. Lots of little guys out there, horny toads they're called. Actually they're greater shorthorned lizards. Really neat. All, all they eat is harvester ants for the most part. Harvester ant colonies that are so big you can see them from space. And moose are said to, for 11 months, they eat the box. And for one month out of the year, they get to eat the cereal. And that's bitter brush in the sage. So they're in the sage, on, again, back on Antelope Flats, digging for bitter brush, which is pretty neat. And in spring, bison drop their calves in the sagebrush. Rough-legged hawks travel all the way from the Arctic to our sagebrush and to our prairies to overwinter. So that's pretty cool. Last month I was <clears throat> at Seedskiddy National Wildlife Refuge. Anybody know where that is? Magical place on the Green River. It was created as a mitigation refuge when Flame, Flaming Gorge and Fontenelle dams were built and they pieced together 40 ranches and created this refuge. And now it's habitat for trumpeter swans and for brooding sage grouse and otters and eagles, my gosh, the eagles, golden eagles and bald eagles. And um, Tom Kerner, the refuge manager, told me when I was there, he said, yeah, somebody saw a bobcat just, you know, here. And so I spent a week looking along this bluff for, for these bobcats. And then one night over the ridge came a little brown shadow. And then I saw three little kittens behind mom. And I got to, until there was no more light left, got to watch this kitten nurse. And then a couple nights later, she showed up in full frame in front of me. And what's cool about this is so it's a bluff that's maybe two or 300 feet above the river. And on top of the bluff is just all sage for as far as the eye can see, only because farming wasn't viable when they tried to do it there. And it's all this sage in which she's hunting up in the sage for small mammals, but she's also going down to the river to maybe, you know, take a coot or a duck that swims by. So that's pretty cool. It can, these animals connect all these ecosystems for us. We're the ones that compartmentalize everything. To them, it's just habitat. And what wonderful habitat it is. And then I'm walking along the river, and I hear screech, screech, screech. And I look up, and there's a prairie falcon nest. Because where there's water, there's life. And so these, this is, uh, it turns out, a, a historic uh, prairie falcon nest. You can see how much whitewash there is here. 
And, um, you know, every 45 minutes or so, like clockwork, she would come in and she would feed either a chipmunk or a ground squirrel to her young. And a couple of times, both the male and the female came to the nest. And then she flies off like this and goes and hangs out for a while and goes and catches something, another meal for her young at the Green River, which, uh, boy, oh, boy, what a, what a wonderful spot that is. Green River is the major tributary of the Colorado River, and there's lots of schemes to, to pull water out of the green and, 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 and divert it someplace else. So uh, it's important that we keep these rivers flowing as best we can. Freedom to roam. Ungulates need freedom to roam. If anybody knows Joe Reese, he's, done, he's the guy. He's done an incredible job as a photographer, as a conservationist, and has a, his own braided river book out, but documenting these ungulate migrations in the West. Animals need to leave the deep snows of the mountains, like here at the Gravelly Range, where they're at, west of West Yellowstone, where they're literally pouring out of the mountains to get to the windswept sagebrush flats so they can survive the race against time that is winter. And that was a, a light hawk aerial image. If you're in Jackson, locals will tell you when the first big, the second big snowfall hits, the pronghorns start to move. And they hit the path of the pronghorn and they start migrating. And where do they go? They go up the Grovant, so they start here by the Tetons and they go up the, the Grovant River and they go up a kind of a mountain pass in, in Alpine, subalpine territory that's not at all pronghorn habitat. But what they're motivated to do is get to those sagebrush, windblown sagebrush lands in the upper Green River Basin. And it's a, it's a roughly 7,000, as far as we know, 7,000 year old migration path. It's the only nationally protected migration corridor. So that's pretty neat. But there's pinch points. So here you can see they travel along the, these red hills uh, bordered by, it's public lands bordered by private lands with a road in the middle. So there's a couple of perilous points for these guys along the way. And then after they spend the winter in the upper Green River Basin, they need to get back so that they can drop their fawns um, and raise their young in Grant Teton National Park. And why is it important? Because they can't survive a winter in Grand Teton. And if they can't migrate, then we lose a species in a national park, which is wholly unacceptable. Our bighorn sheep right here come out of East Yellowstone down into the North Fork of the Shoshone. And they rut in, in autumn, in November and December, and, and spend winter in more, more uh, seasonable climes than up high in Yellowstone National Park. And, and I'm sure a lot of folks here know that bighorns aren't doing particularly well in the West. And, and so we need to guard those corridors and those habitats. And we have great avian migrations. Sandhill cranes will connect everything for us if we're just paying attention. These guys come out of the northern Chihuahuan Desert in central New Mexico at Bosque del Apache National Wildlife Refuge, more public lands, and they travel north. They stop over in, in southern Colorado at Monta Vista National Wildlife Refuge in the San Luis Valley, and they come up here and they disperse throughout the greater Yellowstone ecosystem to breed and to raise these little colts that don't look anything like the adults, these just little orange guys right here. And by fall, they'll be as big as the parents almost, and they'll fly back on migration to Bosque del Apache, which is an incredible place if you're into birding at all. Um, but yeah, this is the Rocky Mountain population of sandhill cranes. There's about 25,000 of them. and. Um, you know, it's a perilous trip that they make twice a year. So we have to be mindful of where we put stuff that might be in their way, like power lines. And we need to make sure that there's water on these refuges so that they can roost and, and survive, uh, both on their, their, their winter range and on their stopovers. So September 22nd, 2015, at Rocky Mountain Arsenal, there was an event. This is in, in near, outside of Denver. And flanked by Western governors, you can see Matt Mead just to the right of Sally Jewell. Secretary of the Interior, Sally Jewell, then Secretary of the Interior. Things have changed. <clears throat> Times have changed. 
she stepped up to the microphone and she said, let me get right to the point. The greater sage grouse does not warrant listing under the Endangered Species Act. And you could see sort of all of the governors kind of just melt because they've been working so hard on this issue. But then she went on to explain how all of the hard work that led up for over a decade to this decision and how people came together and that it was a collaboration of stakeholders from really all walks of life that informed this decision and that there were measures put in place of accountability and that this was in 2015 and in 2020 we're going to reevaluate where we're at and we're going to decide whether we need to list this bird in 2020 and, and, and just see how we did with the priority areas for conservation and all the stuff we put in place. And I had the good fortune of meeting with Secretary Jewell personally afterwards, giving her a book and doing a little photo op and having a nice chat. And boy, was she proud of this collaboration. And what a wonderful thing that is to celebrate. Westerners work together. We put aside our differences and we find a way to work together. We aren't Washington. We aren't all of this divisive stuff. And, and that's where it's at, is conservation and community. This is my favorite conservation quote. Never believe that a few caring people can't change the world. For indeed, that's all who ever have. Margaret Mead. One of those people is Heather Sterling, a rancher in northern northwest Colorado near Steamboat Springs. And she has the Elkhead Ranch, a historic ranch. She has 9,600 acres. I was led to her by the Sage Grouse Initiative, which is a government program that works with ranchers who have sage grouse on their land to help them protect that habitat with conservation easements and habitat improvements. And she put her whole ranch under conservation easement. She even got an offer from Wilford Brimley to buy her ranch, and she turned it down because she didn't want it to turn into condos. Save for a little patch of potatoes that she grows for vodka. It's all protected. <laughs> and she told me, she said, yeah, Dave, I raise cattle. Even if you have a conservation easement, you can still run your business. You can still graze cattle on that, on that piece of land. She said, yeah, Dave, I raise cattle. But what I really do here is I grow birds. And she has four species of grouse on her ranch and nesting sandhill cranes and a lot of the rest. And that's her ranch. So. You know, private landowners, sometimes I think in the cities particularly, we have misperceptions of what ranching is all about, but ranching is stewardship. And this is stewardship maybe at its highest level. Sometimes our conservation meetings happen in different places. So getting back to the Absorca Beartooth Front project that I worked on in 2011, uh, Barbara Cousins is on the right. She was at Greater Yellowstone Coalition. She was here um, and was the one that hired me to come in and photograph this assignment. And Commissioner Joe Tilden is on the left. Commissioner Tilden kindly took us for a horse ride on Sheep Mountain on about a mm, zero wind chill degree day <laughs> with the wind howling up on Sheep Mountain. But it was a great day. And when we got up on top, we tucked into some trees and Joe built a little fire and we just had a chat. And that's the deal, isn't it? We focus on things that we have in common, not the things that divide us. And we agreed on some stuff. And we all agreed that we really didn't want to see greater sage grouse get listed. It, it would just be too severe. And, uh, and I, that's a very memorable thing, that the folks can come together like that and just, in these oddest of circumstances, go for a horse ride. I am not a good horse rider. It was a scary day for me. but but it was fun for all the right reasons. And I worked with a lot of cool folks here um, in that time. I had three expeditions in 2011 uh, where I came up to Cody. Justin Hawkins with the US Forest Service took me on a hike up above the Elk Fork just for this one view of the incredible Absorca Beartooth ranges. Dave Burke is here. He's chuckling. Uh, this is on Hart Mountain, so I had a very memorable hike up Hart and a good chat that day. And Dave and I spent a lot of time together. He, he, he for whatever reason, kindly volunteered to sort of be my tour guide, didn't you? And uh, showed me around. And um, I learned a lot from Dave and, and, we, and made some images uh, that I wouldn't have made otherwise because of him. And, and, and Dave and Nina 
both opened their home and their hearts, and, and, and I stayed with them for a good bit. So I'm really proud to have you as friends. Thank you. And thank you, what you for what you do for conservation. Scott Christensen from Greater Yellowstone Coalition came over. I really wanted to photograph imperiled Yellowstone cutthroat trout, and so we went fishing with a couple of guys from Trout Unlimited on the Gray Bull River. And the reason that's important is because there's lake trout in Yellowstone Lake, and they're eating all of the cutthroat trout. Um, and so that makes the Gray Bull River super important as the second most important uh, Yellowstone cutthroat trout fishery. <clears throat> Rattlesnake Mountain with Heart Mountain behind. Jim Mountain. Holy cow, is it windy up there by Wapiti. <laughs> Out on McCullough Peaks at sunrise. Wonderful badlands. It's just great country around here. But you guys know that. A little more great work. I, I found out about the Upper Hoback about 2010. So this is outside of Bondurant, just south of Jackson. Wyoming range uh, was leased. The Noble Basin in the Upper Hoback, where the, the, wa the top of the watershed starts, was leased to become an industrial gas field for 136 wells by a Houston energy company. And locals were infuriated because this is kind of like the blue collar Wyoming. This is the, the just namesake range, and it's where folks go to hunt and fish. And it's, it's a part of the Wyoming DNA in this part of the world. Dan Bailey was the guy that I met. He's a Bondurant resident. He turned into a very fierce advocate for the river and against this development. Dan Smitherman, the guy in the white hat in front, he, he, he brought the whole thing together. There was the Citizens for the Wyoming Range. Dan stepped in as a Marine. Somebody told him it was hopeless. He said, he told me later, I don't, Dave, I don't know the meaning of the word can't. And he fought hard and 60,000 people wrote letters and they went to public meetings and they raised their voices and the thing got dragged out and ultimately trust for public land came in and they bought those leases and they returned the land to the American people and then it's now been rolled into the Wyoming Legacy Act and it's one of the greatest conservation wins we've had. So people can make a difference if, if we just use our voices because these are our lands. Great stuff. Vermilion Basin in northern Colorado was saved by grassroots conservation. The Rhone Plateau too, just a, a few people coming together, you know, maybe in somebody's basement saying, this can't happen, not here. So what if we thought like this? The ground on which we stand is sacred ground. It is the blood of our ancestors. What if we changed our view shed a little bit? and thought of the land as sacred. So where do we go from here? It's a question of our values, right? What are our, our values for this landscape? Because there's only one sagebrush sea. And these are our public lands as we look at the headwaters of the Grey Bowl. Our Western story isn't finished. The next chapter is up to us. So we had a good outcome on the Absorca Beartooth Front. We got good U.S. Forest Service and BLM land management plans. And it's because of strong leadership and a visionary plan, but most of all, it's because people spoke up. People said this is important. So add your voice for SAGE, for public lands, for the Endangered Species Act, especially now. I wrote three letters to my to my one senator just last week that, that I write constantly, and, and that's, a, that's an important thing, to write real letters, but add your voice, because time is short. Time is really short. And I want to believe that this West is wild enough for the wolf, the grouse, and everything else. Thank you. Great job, Dave. Uh, everything we wanted and more, I think, um, in terms of uh, uh, fitting in with, with what our overarching theme is, and I think inspiring. You know, we, we, we talk about the Draper um, and what we want to do with our exhibits and our programs, and it's, 
It's attract, engage, inform, and inspire. And I think you hit them all right there. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Bonnie Smith again is, is coordinating this program along with the, uh, the Lunchtime Expeditions program so effortlessly. And I know there were some challenges um, at a couple of programs this week. And, you know, people said, boy, watch it. We've got some problems in the co. Yeah, and I said, I said, <laughs> yeah, poltergeist. That's right. I said, don't worry. Bonnie will scare them out of here and everything just smooth. So thank you so much again. And I want to thank the Nancy Carroll Draper Foundation and Sage Creek Ranch for helping sponsor and support uh, all of our Draper lecture series and programming. Thank them so much. Now, um, we instead of having questions here, we have a reception scheduled upstairs and a book signing upstairs in the hub, the main entry into the Draper. So we're going to adjourn here. You have the opportunity um, to meet Dave in person, ask your questions to him there, uh, and I uh, thank you again so much for, uh, for being here this evening. And in August, by the way, we have something, a continuing story on Sagebrush Step and conservation with Brian Rutledge from Audubon Rockies. Um, that'll be a fun one. And next week, next Thursday, our lunchtime expedition, Larry Lohendorf, you showed some wonderful rock art. Um, in this photograph, one of Bonnie's real interests here. Yeah. And we have Larry Lohendorf uh, to bring that part of the human story to the Sagebrush Step in our region uh, on Thursday, of course, 1215, uh, here in the Co-Auditorium. I hope to see you then, too. Thank you so much. <laughs>